Uh, good morning still, everyone. Um, this session we're going to have Alexander Hardy talking about a subject very close to my heart. Taking your Python code, which seems to want infinite CPU and memory, and fitting it into the system that you actually have available to you. Please welcome Alexander Hardy. Great. So thanks for the introduction. Um, so first off, just a little bit of background about uh, what's happening in this talk. This was based on a couple of experiences that I've had uh, some time ago debugging our products. Um, so it's going to be actually framed from a slightly production perspective where there's a, a bunch of limitations on what exactly you can do to debug the issue. Um, so first of all, I can't recollect all of the problems. This was over a period of many years. Um, so some of it's not going to be ac uh, accurate and it's not going to be quite representative of what happened, but it's going to hopefully be a fair representation. Second, uh, I'm not a Python memory expert, so I've got a reasonable idea of what's going on because of my experiences, uh, but you're likely to be able to ask questions that I have no idea how to answer, so please bear that in mind. Uh, the mistakes that we're going to make in these uh, demos are mostly on purpose, um, so please wait to see what's going to happen there. We are going to try to show you how to debug this, and I've chosen to do a live demo, so hopefully that works, hopefully it doesn't bite me, um, but we'll see uh, how we actually can go through this process on a live demo. So the plan is, and I think I might have to cut some of it due to time, but the plan was to debug a memory leak, um, tackle some fragmentation problems, uh, deal with some reference cycles issues, uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later, and then um, high CPU. I uh, see it's busy hiding the slide there. Uh, so when we have a tight loop in Python, how do we find out what exactly is going on? Um, are there any techniques we can use to find out where we blocked? And then the takeaway lessons from this experience. So why do we care about the high memory? Um, if you read about things like this on the internet, you'll often find people say things like, well, we can just let the Python process consume a lot of memory. We've got a lot of memory on our servers, so that's OK. And every now and then, we'll just kill it to reset the memory footprint. And there's a couple of reasons why we don't want to do that. In our kind of environment, we're doing a lot of glue code, so we're interacting with other components. We do a lot of calls out to other processes. And to do that, we have to do a fork um, to launch the other process. And that fork has to copy your memory. And if you don't have huge uh, page tables, you've got a 4K page size, then what can happen is if you're using a lot of memory, that takes a lot of time. And it starts to dominate the cost in your process. So things like that make a difference. The other problem is that as you increase the memory size of your process, uh, at least in my experience, it tends to get a lot slower. Python's not very good at being a cache coherent kind of system in any case, but as you increase the amount of memory and you have fragmentation and so on, that gets even worse. So you do have performance problems from that as well. In our case, we use the twisted HTTP server, so shutting down the process and restarting it again uh, means that it typically cancels the calls that are in progress. You don't get to shut down those HTTP calls cleanly, which generally has an impact on the system. <coughs> And uh, we're working to address that, which we'll discuss a little bit later. What kind of restrictions do we have? Um, often when we go and debug these issues, we're not allowed to install other packages. We're in production-like environments or production environments. In production, we're normally uh, aiming to get the issue resolved quickly, so you might end up just restarting the service anyway to make sure that it comes back to a normal state where you can serve uh, requests cleanly. Um, so the customer experience is paramount. But in QA environments, we have the same kind of uh, limitations. We're not just allowed to go and install packages. We're doing something like production, so we get the production experience. But we do get a little bit more time to debug what's going on. So we're going to try to set up, set up a couple of live demos to illustrate some of the problems that we've encountered and how we went about debugging them. And to do that, we're going to use Python 2.7. We're going to use the Twisted Asynchronous Programming Framework. Um, we're going to try to stay away from the details about Twisted. That's not really what the talk is about. Um, and we're going to use the Twisted Manhole. And that's one part of Twisted which is really important to this talk, is the manhole. That provides us a Telnet interface into our Python process and gives us a Python interpreter which we can interact with directly. And that allows us to inspect the internal state um, and do various things with the program. And we're also going to restrict ourselves as much as possible to only using Python standard libraries for debugging all of these issues. Uh, so I'll mention a couple of third-party libraries, but that's not going to be our focus. We're going to be working on uh, standard Python libraries. 
So first we have to introduce a RESTful service with some problems that we can debug. And to do that, I'm going to be looking at two files, model.py and gc1.py. I try to keep it as simple as possible. And later on, if you want to go and get that code, you can go and get that. So let's start off just with a model.py. This is trying to simulate a database. It's not actually connected to a database. It's going to pretend to be a database where we have asynchronous communication with the database. So we have a database model. Uh, it's going to specify the actual database name that we're going to work with and some kind of table. We're assuming that is going to be some kind of relational database. And for some other reason, we decided that figuring out what are the columns in this database, the fields that we're going to work with, is very expensive. So we're going to have a field cache. We're going to retrieve objects from this database using a, a fixed identifier. And then we're going to just go and instantiate it. This is going to be um, a basis for our database object. And we're just going to go and make a random choice from the fields. I'm going to gloss over this a little bit. Um, I'm not too concerned about the details. It's more about you know, what the framework is that we're using. And then we'll go into the details from there. Um, to be able to do that, it has to figure out what fields it has to populate. So it's going to call get fields on DB model. And here we've decided to implement a cache for our fields. So we go and figure out, does this class for the database model uh, already exist? Um, if it's not in the cache, go and populate it. Otherwise, give the value out of the cache. We have a two primitive method as well, which is going to convert this database model, our Python object model, to a primitive form, a Python dictionary, and Python strings, and integers, and so on. And eventually, we're going to encode that as JSON to ship that out. And here is one database model that we're working with. This is an attendee for the Python conference. Um, please don't look at the data that we've populated there. It's much harder to actually figure out what is random data for a um, demo program than it is to actually write the program itself. Um, and in this case, the get fields is actually just going to return those static field members that we have there. OK, so I don't want us to get too bogged down in the details of the code, because that can take some time. Um, but if you have questions, if something is unclear, then you can ask me about that. So this is the actual web server. It's going to be using the database model that we've declared, and it's going to go and fetch individual items for that. Um, I'm going to hop down to the bottom quickly so we can see what's going on there. Um, before we do that, the key twisted portions that we're going to use is the twisted web server and resource that creates our HTTP server for us. And then we're going to use the twisted manhole. And just to note there that this is actually the old way of doing it, but it was quick. So uh, I quickly created a shell factory there which is going to be our telnet session into this Python client. So basically how it starts is we create a, a simple site. It listens on port 8080, um, and it's created from this demo object. So that demo is going to actually serve the HTTP requests. And then we create a shell factory. That's the telnet session. And it's got a username and password, both set to demo. And we listen on port 20,000 for that. And then it just tells us what's the PID so we can go and monitor it and see what's going on. Now, the actual demo class, what we really care about is this render get. So when we do a get on slash, it's going to invoke this code. And basically, it's going to say, I'm going to serve some JSON content, go and render that to the request that I have there, and say, well, I'm not done yet. I'm going to finish later. This is asynchronous programming. And in the render list, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to say, go and fetch all of the attendees from the database. Um, convert it to primitive uh, Python objects, and then do a JSON dump, and then finish. None of this is intended to be good code. It's all intended to show some of the problems we encounter. And over here at get attendees, we're going to go and fetch single attendees from the database, a thousand of them, and just go and return that. And the get attendee from database, we suddenly realized, you know, it's not just any PyCon, it's PyCon. 2016. So PyCon ZA 2016 is actually the database we want to use. Uh, let's quickly go and construct a class from that, inheriting from an attendee, and we're going to get it from there. Uh, shout if there's any questions along the way. Hopefully that this isn't too overwhelming. You'll see a lot of yields here. Um, we're basically using some of the twisted structures that allow us to do uh, you can think of it as multi-threaded programming, but it isn't. And basically the yield is saying give control back um, to another process, to Twisted Reactor, or give up the CPU while it's doing some kind of I.O. operation. And when the I.O. operation is complete, then this will continue with its further work. Um, it is, in fact, a generator, but it's helpful to think of it as giving up the CPU. 
Okay, so that's the, the background that we're going to work with. Now we're going to try to see if we can execute this. Um, I'm actually using a Linux environment, not the Mac, um, so that I get better behavior from the garbage collector. Um, the kind of behavior I want is I want it to do a bad thing and I want to be able to show that it's bad. Okay, so we're going to start off quickly with gc1.py. Just to show you that it's working, we've got Firefox over there, I can load the page, and there it goes and delivers a whole bunch of attendees. Don't look at the details there because although it's random, it doesn't turn out to be random enough. Um, I can try. Um, there we go. Um, this is not going to be the very important part, actually. What we're actually going to care about is this terminal over here. Let's also increase that size there. No. It did increase the size, but it's not there anymore. I think the cursor was huge. There we go. So what I want to do here is a top. Um, just to see what the memory footprint is. And there I see it's about 28 megabytes. And now I'm going to load this server a little bit. So there's a, a bunch of kill commands. I'm just going to fetch the same data 20 times. So let's just execute that and see what happens. Uh, before I do that, just to save some time, I'm going to actually um, Telnet into this program on port 20,000. Okay, so I log in with demo and demo. And now I'm going to just prepare what we're going to do going ahead just to save some time. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. So I'm going to say from debug, import mem debug. That's this. That's not good. This is nasty about uh, twisted. Uh, the manhole, it actually caused an error in my application as well. Not great. Um, let's see what I did wrong. Oh, thanks. Going too fast. Of course, you lose half of your brain power when you stand up in front of a bunch of people. Oh, there, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Would happen now. Okay, there we go. Um, there we go. So that's going to initialize it. So that's standing at 33 now, which is great. Um, and we're going to do a dot slash kill dot sh. So there we've got 21 of them running. In the meantime, our memory is shooting up. It's going crazy. So we should, I'm not going to wait for that to finish now. I'm going to start debugging it. OK, so I'm going to do a mem dot analyze. That'll help me to figure out what's going on. Um, before we go further there, let's quickly go and discuss how we debug memory. So this I have to get out here again. That's nasty in how it behaves. So how do we debug memory leaks? There's a couple of thing, tools that you can use, and we want to kind of model what these tools do. One of them is Guppy or Heapy. Um, it allows you to create uh, an object, determine what the heap looks like at the, at the beginning, and then what it looks like at the end, and display the difference between the two heaps in terms of the objects, their count, their size, etc. Uh, I know that's probably not going to come out too nicely on the video, but you know, we'll see it nicely when we do it in our own code. Uh, another thing we're interested in, about in is um, the references to objects. So which objects are actually keeping these things in memory? Uh, and something you can use there is object graph. And again, there's some details about what you can do there. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can implement it, uh, this ourselves. So our first gut feel is we say, well, how does memory management in Python work. And if you go and look it up, you find out that it's primarily a reference counting scheme. And then we've got full garbage collection cycles when the reference counting fails, which we'll see later on. So we're going to presume that it's a reference counting problem, that we've still got a reference to the object, and we have to go and debug that. So there is a GC package in Python that you can use to go and find out what's going on with the garbage collector. There's a couple of methods that we're interested in. The first one is collect. And that's because <clears throat> before we start doing analysis, we want to make sure that we have a clean slate. Garbage collection must have already happened. Uh, we don't want to have objects hanging around that are going to be collected later. We want to see the things that are hanging around because they can't be collected. So that's one of the methods. Um, the other one is gc.getobjects, which tells you about all the things that are being tracked by the collector. And that's how we find out which objects are in the system and being retained. And then we have from the sys package, get size of 
which is going to tell us what is the size of an object. So that's going to allow us to tell people like this object is consuming so much space um, and allow us to categorize it so that we can quickly try to figure out which objects are actually responsible. <clears throat> and then the gc.get referrers tells us which objects have a reference to this object and we're going to use that to trace back to what is the thing that's actually responsible for keeping everything in memory. Okay, and that's actually saying that I should run the demo now. Um, that's fine. We'll just go over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually write our own heap analyzer. So this is one that I wrote quickly when I had to debug um, an issue in a production-like environment and I used it through a manhole. And uh, it's been refined a little bit since, but it's essentially the tool that I wrote at that time. So when I instantiated it, it actually called setBase, which said, what is the current state of the heap? That's normally the analysis that I want to do. I want to say it's a starting state, something's happened, it leaked memory, what do I do from there? So what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to get the objects in the system, those tracked by the garbage collector, but I only do it after I've done a collection. <laughs> Uh, please don't ask me why I collect twice, I can't remember, but uh, I think there's um, a problem that some objects actually stick around a little bit if you're not careful with that. So it's got two collections there. So we get the objects, and then we need to find out which objects were actually there before and which objects are um, now new objects. To do that, we've got to track those objects in some way, and in CPython, one of the best ways is to look at the pointer for that object. That's going to give us an idea of what's going on. So ID in CPython gives us the pointer to that particular item. So we're going to use the ID to find out where that is. We get the list of base IDs, and we create an ID map just for quick lookup. It's a terrible use of memory, but at least we'll be able to quickly find out which IDs are actually in use before or not. When we do an analyze, we do exactly the same thing. We're basically going to do a get objects and go and collect those different objects that we have available. But we're going to be selective. We don't want to collect any of the objects that we have already. So, you know, we might have collected some information here. Uh, we don't want that. So this is the restricted set. So anything that is not in the restricted set, I'm going to keep track of, and anything else is a new object in the system. And then I can say, you know, go through them, make sure that I'm not picking up the leaked. Um, all of this is fairly careful programming to avoid tracking down things that I already have. So it's actually possible, if you're not careful, to do your whole memory collection, uh, your memory analysis and everything. You track it back again and you find out, what is the reference holding this object? Well, it's my manhole. I'm holding it, not the program. Um, so we do it very carefully there. We make sure that we delete references to objects when we're done, uh, and so on. And there's also a little bit of a type analysis here. So we just convert the type of this object to a string, and we use that to index an array and group that together, compute the sizes there. That just helps for analysis. Um, so there's a couple of other things there. Refs is going to help us to get the references, but, but exclude things that we're already keeping track of here. So our own list of base IDs, our base ID map, and so on. Um, and there's top, which is going to show the top consumers in the program and give us an idea of where that is actually being spent, where the memory is. Okay, that's all I'm going to look at for the moment. Let's quickly see if we can get here. I hope this doesn't go funny because of the change in display. Okay, so we've done an analyze. So now we're going to do a mem.top, and I normally take about uh, 10 of those. And so it tells us that a type is actually the most expensive object that we have. It's got the most space in, in the process at the moment. So I'm going to take that. And let's just have a look at one of them. So I'm going to go look at mem.type and paste that in there. And that's going to give me the list of those objects. And I'm just going to look at the first one. Uh, I'm normally very careful in what I do here because it can actually dump a whole bunch of stuff on the screen and that makes it very difficult to go back and figure out what you're doing. So um, I know it's a type in this case, so I can dump it fairly safely. Um, and I look at the zero one and, hey, it's a new attendee. That's my class that I created earlier. I wonder why that is. So. Let's go and get the list of references. So we're going to do mem.refs, um, and we're going to just pull out this first one, and be careful about what we get back. The length of R is three. Let's uh, have a look at the types of these things. Um, it's a dictionary, dictionary, and a tuple. Okay, that looks all right, so maybe I can have a look at what is um, the length of these. Again, I'm being very conservative here to make sure that you know, I don't dumb stuff to the screen and go 
crazy and I can't follow what's going on. Well, the first one is clearly a problem. You know, that doesn't look good. So maybe we can find out what that is. Okay, that's a dictionary. Uh, let's find out what, what is holding that. So let's just dull X so that we don't have a reference to that anymore. And then we're going to create a second list, which is going to be mem.refs for um, R0. Let's track where that is. Let's see what len R2 is. It's got a length of two, that's good. So we can say type x for x in R2. And the first one is a dict, and the second one is a list. Let's do the length as well. And there we go, the first one's 11. So that's reasonable, I can go and display that. So I can say what is r20.keys. And I see it's got a database. Um, two primitive get fields and so on. Uh, that looks interesting. Uh, let's go one more up. Let's go r3 equals mem.refs r20. This is the point where I think, oh, I'm supposed to know what's going on, but um, it's not quite fitting in, in my head quite yet. The demo is going badly. Okay, so let's have a look at then r3. That's two, and we can go type x, 4x in r3, and it did go badly. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to go back here, and I'm just going to notice that there's one particular name that jumps out at me there. Um, I'm going to actually have to, oh, no, it's actually not going badly. I'm not reading. I can just have a look at r30, because it's my DB model, and it's my cache. And it's a problem because I was dynamically creating class every time and I was putting the class in the dictionary as the key. And it's a new class every time because it's dynamically created and that's where my memory leak is. And now I have to hope that I'm not out of time. <laughs> um, so, 10 minutes, okay, good. So that means we're not gonna do other demos, but that's the starting point. Or at least, maybe we'll fit in one other demo. Um, there we go. So that's good news, I figured out what my memory leak is. Um, it is, in fact, uh, this DB model. Uh, I'm going to show just differences in the code now. I'm hoping that that's going to come out fairly clearly and people can see what's going on. Uh, it just turns out it's a very bad idea with the way that I've been programming this to cache those fields. So, you know, I'll come to the performance aspects later. At the moment, I'm just going to strip that out. So I'm going to get rid of the field cache, and whenever I want to go and find out what the fields are, I'm just going to go and ask that model directly and say, what are your fields? At least that takes care of the memory. Um, uh, problem for the moment, and because we're not doing any kind of performance analysis for this talk, we're okay. We're good. Okay, and uh, there we go. I also accidentally changed the database to the PyCon ZA 2016, but that doesn't matter. It's not really important at this stage. So that was great. That's good. Uh, we actually don't see many of those issues in um, our code because um, you know, we're pretty careful when we code this stuff. So that doesn't happen often, so that's good. This is actually the kind of problem that we normally face, is I've done this analysis, um, I don't have leaks happening like that. What, what is actually causing this problem? Um, so I have a situation where my resident size for my application is actually still large. So I can show you an example of that. Uh, actually, let's just do that. Uh, CD Python, that's good. So this is a, another process. All I've added is an extra background task, which is just allocating memory, moving the memory around, getting rid of the memory again. But it's running at the same time as my web server. So I'm going to run a curl against that again. And I want to do a top again just to see what's happening. And there it's already at 64. I, I should have shown you what it's like at the start, but it's already at 64. Uh, I can see whether it stops running. All of them have gone through. Run it again. And this is with a fixed code now. And the memory's still climbing. You know, what's going on there? So I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm not going to be able to debug it very well with my mem debug um, because, in fact, I've fixed the other problem that I had. So I'm going to show you what the actual problem is. Uh, actually, I want to just check that that is done. 
Um, I don't know where I am anymore. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to call dumb pointers. And all that really does is it calls gc.get objects, gets the ID for the object, dumps the ID so I know where the point is in memory. And then um, also figures out what the size of the object is and writes that out to a, a, a file, which is under gc2 pointers.txt. And so it's just a bunch of, of things there. There's some huge numbers there. And the problem with that is that um, I've got too many Python processes in the first place. But if you cat slash proc slash uh, 3579 slash maps, uh, you can actually see what memory is allocated. And things like this right at the bottom over there, that is where some of the memory is landing. So it's 64-bit pointers that I have there. Uh, let's go into GC2. Now, what I'm going to do is I've got um, a heat map program. I don't want to go into that too much. Basically, what it's going to do is go through these pointers, break it up into like 4K pages or something like that, and just say, how many times do I actually see an element there? Um, and that takes a little while. And it's going to process through that. It takes a little while because it's written in a very bad fashion. It's not performant at all. And, but it gives us the results. Who cares about the rest? OK, so that's going to go through. And we're almost done. It's doing it twice, uh, because I find that it's useful to have two different maps. The one shows you an actual color, which will be a grayscale, which is how many bytes do we have in that page. Um, and the other one is a binary map. It's just, do I have anything in that particular uh, page in memory or not. <coughs> and I'll just open it up in GIM quickly. And we're going to zoom here. Yeah, let's see. Uh, there, like that. Oh, it's not as nice as I hoped it would be. It's probably because of where I, when I grabbed it. Um, I should show you another one. Let's go to the slide a little bit, I think. OK. So there was kind of not waiting for the garbage collector to run properly or anything like that. So that, that came out a lot more dense than I actually expected. The typical kind of heat map that you get looks a little bit more like that. And I've had it even worse than this. So the key thing that you see there is that there's large black spots between all of the rest. And that's memory fragmentation. That's due to how Python's allocating the memory. So I've got this background task, creating memory. Um, so that puts like an upper bound on where the memory is at that point based on the other HTTP requests that are running at the same time. Then the memory for those HTTP requests are freed, and you've got this hole. And then the question is, for the next run, can I reuse that? Maybe, maybe not. And so I might go and end up using other memory. So in this particular application, if I keep running my curl commands, what I actually see is the memory cre increases, 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 then drops. It gets to a point where Python can actually give the memory back to the operating system. And this is also a lot of black at the end because I've got, due to those 64-bit pointers and so on, things ending up at the end of the range uh, where they packed over there, and then I've got some at the start of the range. Uh, but that is one of the problems that we can pick up. And the solution that we have to this case is obviously, well, it's a really bad idea to pull all your results into memory. Let's go and use something that looks like a cursor. So we're going to create something that looks like a cursor. It gives us one object at a time. It reduces the resident set of the database results in memory. And that uh, is what solved that problem. Uh, as amazing as it may seem, we did actually have our initial implementation pull in all of those results at a time and then dump it out. Because you think, hey, you've got memory on your machines. And but this can't be that big. I mean, the thousand JSON documents it can't be that big. But Python can surprise you, especially when you find out that uh, every object is backed by a dictionary, and the dictionary has to have free space available to resize and things like that. OK, so how much time do I have left? Five minutes. OK, we can race through some of the other stuff. Um, so that is just where we're iterating through it. We build the JSON ourselves instead of giving a whole list, and so on. Uh, one other problem that we faced is circular references. Um, I haven't been able to reproduce it, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, there's a slightly different thing that I've done here. Um, here I've got an object which is an atten attendee with a diet, 
um, and that added an extra field and I decided to add an address as well. It's a really silly example. So I instantiate an address. I think you can just see it at the bottom of the screen and the address object also has a reference to the attendee. And then I was really stupid because I come from a C++ background and I decided, you know, I need destructors for this thing. So I'm going to put in this underscore underscore del. I read it somewhere in a Python document and it seems like a good idea. And then Python said to me, whenever there are reference cycles and there's underscore underscore del, then I do not collect it. So we're done and all of those things stay there. And that's where we come to gc.garbage. You can actually go and look at that and say, what have you not collected? And Python will tell you. Uh, and the takeaway from that is don't ever use DAL unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. Like if you're writing a database cursor and you need to make sure the database frees the resources on the other side. Something like that. Okay, um, so that was really quick. The problem that we actually had in production was not this. We actually had a problem that we were creating objects dynamically, the classes, actually not the objects, we were creating the classes dynamically, and that creates a reference cycle. Uh, so I said here it's easier than you think because every time you create a new style class, it creates an MRO field. MRO is the method resolution order. It says first try this object for your method, then this object, then this object, um, or sorry, classes. And one of those classes is your own class. So you've got a class referring to a list or a tuple and that refers to your class again. And what we had is the garbage collector was very slow at collecting that because you can't, when you dereference it, um, it doesn't go down to zero. It goes to one something like that, and a little bit later, we have to go and collect it again. So it just takes a while. When you create a lot of those, and they don't get collected immediately, they start accumulating, and they cause a problem for your process. And that, that was basically it for the garbage collection. I thought I'd do one more. I don't know how we're doing for time. Maybe I'll just um, talk about it. Three minutes. Okay, so uh, the last one is just how do you debug high CPU? I'll give you a quick demonstration. Use uh, set trace. Um, let's just do that, and this takes all of my three minutes. Okay, so um, so this is a lovely program that I've uh, written, which has got a tight loop. So. What's going to happen is I'm going to go to Firefox, I'm going to try to load the page, and it just fails. Um, so let's, let's use our manhole. I mean, that, that's a good idea. Manhole doesn't work. Oh, shucks. Okay, let's see. It's a tight loop. The uh, twisted reactor is getting no time to service the manhole request, so it can't do that. Uh, so let's quickly get the Python process. Um, yeah, that worked. <laughs> and we'll do a strace. What was it? Dash uh, P3910. And. Oh, that doesn't tell me anything. So, what we've done is we've uh, put in a signal handler. So, I can do a kill dash user1 on 3910. And that's going to give me. Uh, wrong directory. That gives me a trace.txt. And I just use a kill dash user2 to stop it. And let's have a look at trace.txt. It's taking way too long to load. It tells me it's on high CPU, line 38 and 39. Um, so I can go to line 38, and there it says it's include result. And I can say, where does include result come from? And it's over there. I didn't actually iterate to the next item in the cursor. I'm just going to stop it there, because that shows you some of the details. Um, really what we're using there, and you can look at that further if you're interested in that, is set trace, which is a function that Python will invoke uh, whenever it calls a function or returns from a function, and you can use that to trace that. You can write to a file or whatever. Um, and you can do it whether or not you've enabled profiling or anything in Python. So any existing Python process, you can turn this on and track that. And uh, now we can go to, let's skip what the debug tools are, what are the lessons learned. My key takeaways are not what you might think. It's got nothing to do with garbage collection in Python, whether you know the GC module or not. It's got to do with every language that you use, you actually have to know how the memory management works. Maybe not in excruciating detail, but it's going to bite you at some time. And not having to deal with pointers doesn't mean that your problems are gone. 
you have to actually be aware of how the system works so that when it does have problems that you can actually go and figure out what's, what's going on there. And that's the end. Questions? Okay, so if you don't know the internals of Python and you're stuck with just system debugging tools, so perf and GDB memory dumps and that kind of thing, where would you recommend people start? Uh, so first of all, I've never done that myself. I know that some of our team have looked at um, GDB with symbols so that you can actually connect to the, the process and see it in terms of the Python memory layout and so on, and that helps you. Um, it's, it's really hard to say. I, th I think what really helps for me is having a good general knowledge. Um, so figuring out, you know, can you use S-Trace? S-Trace has helped me before to deb debug problems, for example, in high CPU, but it only works in some cases. You know, like in this particular case, it didn't help me at all. Uh, I've seen it work when I saw that the fork process was taking too long, and that's where the issue was. And so it's really a case of sometimes you can debug it and sometimes you can't, and you have to know what the tools are available and try to figure out what the best tool is. In this case, I find that Manhole and the built-in Python kind of stuff is the best because it brings you the closest to the actual platform that you're working on, and so you can actually manipulate it directly. It's very easy to interact with it. Um, in the case of a Manhole, you can actually load the objects, inspect it. I've used the GC before and said, hey, go and find all objects which are instances of this controller. Uh, whatever thing I've written. Go and inspect each one of those and look to see what the different values are that have been set. Uh, so other than that, I can't give really good guidelines because, I mean, I've got a limited experience from what I've done, but, yeah, I think that every tool is valuable and you have to figure out which, when is the right time to use which tool based on your restrictions and um, what you see is happening. Um. I'm going to just add a quick uh, recommendation for VMProf as a profiling tool, which um, Richard spoke about yesterday. Uh, excellent tool and really useful for the CPU type stuff and very easy to use. So for the, just so for the memory fragmentation, Sorry, yes. So for the memory fragmentation, um, long loading process, this seems to always happen. Is there any real hints on how we can try and avoid this in a general case? I mean, um, so from my experience, you know, you don't have much control over that. So the key thing is to try to control how your allocation happens. Um, and there also you have got limited options. So I know some people use slots, for example, in the classes to make sure that it's tightly bound and you've got a fixed amount of detail there. You can have pre-allocated objects um, of that size if you're having significant problems there. Um, in my experience, if you can just work on figuring out what is actually consuming those memory to create those holes and work on keeping that small, more working on a residence set kind of basis, then that's what's worked the best for me. So we found that our memory uh, structure is a lot better when we just switch to using cursors and we just know that we're going to bring in a couple of objects from the database at a time. Uh, and that's kind of the focus where I've been looking at where we were pulling things in from the database and then shipping it out again. Um, and that worked well. So, so that's kind of what the focus has to be. Is if you've got a memory issue and your problem is that you're creating these holes and the, the memory is getting large and that's unacceptable in your environment, then you're going to have to look at saying, how do I make it a resident set thing with the resident set is a, a, applicable for my application? something that's worthwhile there. Uh, there's, of course, other options. So I focused specifically on Python 2.6 and Python 2.7 here, because that's the kind of environment where we saw this problem. Um, and when this happened, the next thing I looked at is I said, what kind of other Python VMs are there that we can use? Can we use Python 3? Can we use PyPy? Because they have different kind of garbage collectors. They've got copying collectors, which allows it to repack the memory to get rid of those holes. Um, in our case, it wasn't feasible for us to use that, so we had to go other routes. But that's why it helps. You know, you go and have a look at your particular environment and say, what kind of collection do they do? In the case of the Python 2.6 uh, virtual memory system, once that object is allocated, it's there. End of story. It can never move. It's permanently had an impact on your program. It's never going to be, um, it's never going to move from there until you actually get rid of that object. So that's something to take into account. 
And that's also important when you're deciding you know, for, on a platform, which one are you going to use? What impact is it going to have later on your system? I have a follow-up question to that one, and based on something you just said. You say you want to try to keep the gap small. Do you have any reason or intuition around what small would mean? Is it very dependent on your system? And so I haven't actually um, computed any values for our system to see what that is. Um, so I, I don't have a gut feel. I know in our system, you know, if we go up to about 500 objects from the database at a time, then we're doing pretty well. Then we keep our footprint generally under um, about 100 megabytes. If we go have a high degree of concurrency, then that can push up because then you have multiple batches in memory at the same time. But that's been pretty good. Um, I also noticed that you know, if you're dealing with primitives themselves instead of Python objects, you often get better performance because the, the backing of the Python object, the methods that are invoked, the monkey patching that we do for all sorts of weird reasons, um, all of those things tend to increase the footprint of those objects quite a lot. So that's actually where I kind of focus is um, more on the Python objects which have got lots of things associated with that. Go and take care of those. Those generally have a larger footprint than the, the primitive types. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to answer these questions. It's much easier when you actually have the data presented in front of you or an application that's misbehaving and you can say, well, that thing's doing um, a very bad thing and, well, how was it structured? Well, you've got multiple levels of inheritance here. Maybe we don't need that for this particular part or something like that. Um, yeah, so it, it becomes a very application specific. Any more questions? Otherwise, I think it's time to break for tea. Great. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>